At the end of the first of this week's two Torah portions, Parshat Matos, the tribe of Reuven and the tribe of God approach Moses, Moshe, and they ask for permission to settle in the recently conquered lands outside of Israel. After Moshe gets assurances from them that they will indeed fight alongside their brethren during the conquest of Israel, he gives them permission, and those two tribes, along with half the tribe of Manasseh, end up settling outside of Israel. They are roundly criticized by the commentators for various reasons. Some explain that the motivations for those tribes in seeking to reside outside of Israel was base. They were greedy. They had flocks, and they were seduced by the very fertile land outside of Israel. They put profits over people. Others say it was a little more subtle. They felt that as shepherds, they'd have more free time on their hands to commune with the divine, to work on spirituality, to study Torah. That sounds great. One problem. If God tells you to go to Israel, go to Israel. Figure out how to use a plow. Become a farmer. You might have less free time on your hands. But if God tells you to do something, you do it. Others say it was even more nuanced. The reason that they wanted to settle outside of Israel is that they knew that Moshe was not going to make it into Israel. He was going to die outside and be buried in the lands that they were seeking. So they'd have the burial place of our greatest leader in their area. And in his merit, They'd have greater spiritual heights, and they'd be protected. So what's wrong with that? That sounds very noble. The problem with that is that they thought it was going to happen automatically. It was going to be a segula, a good omen. Without any work, the mere fact that the burial plot of the lawgiver Moshe is in their plot is in their area, that's going to help them. And we sometimes make the same mistake. We go out and we take those little red strings that we get from the tomb of Rachel and we wear them around our wrist. Or we take our our little fingers and we dip them in the wine after Havdalah on Saturday night and then we touch our eyes for illumination and our ears for inspiration and our pockets so we can be enriched. Imagine, you have a kid, make him a 13-year-old boy, and he does something wrong. He breaks your antique valuable vase because he's using it as a basketball hoop. Big mistake. And a few hours later when you've simmered down, you're going to talk to him and you're going to decide the appropriate punishment. So imagine why you're talking to him and you're explaining to him why what he did was so wrong. He keeps putting his hand up in front of his face and he's moving it around and he's all sorts of awkward movements and finally you say, what are you doing? I'm trying to talk to you. This is very serious. Why do you keep doing that with your hand? And he says, oh, Dad, I just want to make sure you see that I'm wearing one of those red strings around my wrist so I'm automatically protected, so I shouldn't be punished. You know, you'd look at him and you'd say, you just don't get it, do you? But imagine that same kid, same infraction, same conversation a few hours later. You start to explain why what he did was so wrong, and he says to you, Dad, I don't want to cut you off, but I want to tell you something. I know what I did was terribly wrong. I have incredible remorse and regret, and I spent the last few hours not just thinking about it, but doing something about it. You know how my room is always a colossal mess and you and mom are always telling me to clean it up? Can I come show it to you? So you follow him along, you open the door to his room, and you can't believe what you're looking at. Spick and span, spotless, okay? And he says, look, I know this is just one small measure of showing you a token of regret and remorse, but could you at least take it into consideration when you decide my punishment? That might make a difference. So too, when we wear those little red strings, if we're thinking... You know why I'm wearing this red string? Because every time I look at it, it reminds me of our saintly matriarch, Rachel, Rachel Imenu. And I'm reminded of how kind she was and of how jealous she wasn't. And I resolve to emulate those character traits. Then we might be getting somewhere. Then that segula, that good omen, may be meaningful. If when I dip my fingers into the wine on Saturday night after Havdalah and I touch them to my eyes, I utter a silent prayer, God, please illuminate the way for me. And I resolve to use my eyes to only look at the right things and to see God this week. And I touch my ears, God, please inspire me. And I'm going to listen to your messages this week. And when I put my fingers into my pockets, I say, God, please enrich me because I know that every dollar that I make comes from you. And I'm going to resolve to make every dollar honestly. Now that may be a meaningful segula. And maybe that's why God, at the end of the day, never let us know exactly where Moshe was buried because he didn't want to turn that burial place into a shrine, flocked to by people who would think, 
All we need to do is visit, and it's in the bag. There are no shortcuts in Judaism, and there are no shortcuts in life. Segulas are great, but let's really put something into them.